Okay, folks, a uh, very quick uh, reminder that your quizzes are available to pick up upstairs. So please pick them up when you get a chance because otherwise I'll take them into my office and you might never see them again for the rest of the semester. So pick them up as soon as you can, just to check to make sure I haven't screwed up in the grading because I do screw up and I openly admit to it. But check the grading template, make sure I have, if you got a point in your favor, just let it go. Don't You don't have to bring it to me and I'll, I'll give you an honesty cop out on this one. You don't have to feel particularly guilty about it because it'll all even out if not in this class in life, so let it go, right? A um, couple of things. One is I hope you opened up the email about the case I sent yesterday. If you haven't, please do so. It's due three weeks from today, which sounds like a long time away, but remember spring break is right in the middle, right? So it's essentially going to take one of the three weeks out and you really have the ammunition to start working on the case. And I think you can't put it off till you come back on the Monday because it's due on the Wednesday after the spring break. So do get some work done before the spring break. And if you're going to the Caribbean, take your laptop with you, sit on the beach and work on the case. Right? And to be very specific, this is not a Harvard Business School case. There's no strategic imperative. There's no storytelling. I don't interview the CEO. This is really a case I concoct every year. Keyword is concoct. Based on something I find interesting. Now, last year, the case was about Tesla introducing a robot. You've seen the Tesla robots. This was about the Tesla bot and what it can create. The year before was Apple iCar, which, as you probably read, they've abandoned the electric car business. But what if Apple... So it's essentially taking a company that's out there and making them do something and say, would if you are the decision maker, that's really what the case is about. Would you advise, and this year's case is about Costco, how many of you have a Costco membership? You're too young to probably have one. No. It, if you've ever been in a Costco score, a store, it is an experience. It's So if you have a friend who's a member who can take you along, go into a Costco, it's part of the homework for the case. You know, It's a huge box store. You buy everything in bulk. You buy cornflakes. It's enough to eat for 365 days. You probably need a donkey to carry it home. It's that big. No, but it is a very interesting concept because it is one of the few players in the game, the retail game in the U.S. that has fended off Amazon. Amazon has decimated the retail business, right? You look at traditional department stores. You can see Macy's, you can see Nordstrom's, all struggling. Target had a good quarter, but their best days are behind them. In fact, there are, only, there are only two brick and mortar U.S. retail stores that have held their own. One is Costco. The other is dollar, the dollar store until, or Dollar General until it got into a problem with inflation where everything could not be a dollar anymore. It's tough to call yourself the dollar store when everything is a dollar 29. The dollar 29 store, I guess, doesn't sound as good. But they, And so Costco is a membership model which means to go into the store, you have to show your Costco card, which already strikes people as strange, right? If you're a retailer, you're saying, why would you turn customers away? But it's actually worked incredibly well for them because it creates a selection bias. The people who buy Costco memberships are the people Costco wants as customers, so it creates this membership model. It's a very interesting twist on how even screening a little bit up front can create a valuable business model. So this takes a traditional Costco store. Costco has been incredibly successful, both in terms of stock price, earnings, revenues, but it's kind of hitting a wall because they have 500 plus Costco stores. They've saturated the U.S. There are very few parts of the U.S. where you don't have a Costco store. They need to grow. And this is, you know, this case is about giving them an option to grow. Okay? And what the case is about is, have you ever been in a minute clinic in a CVS? I'm asking you questions about why are you asking me these questions? This is about my life. If you've been in a minute clinic in a CVS, many CVSs have minute clinics where you have nurse practitioners, not doctors. So you have the flu or you think you have COVID. You go in, they do, they do the test, and then they can't prescribe major, but they can prescribe enough medication or send you to an emergency room if needed. No. What, what this case is about is Costco opening their versions of a minute clinic, a bigger, more involved minute clinic, 
in each in their most heavily trafficked Costco stores. Okay. For those of you who have, know the logistics of a Costco store, there's a pharmacy in many in almost every Costco store right now, and right next to the pharmacy, I know more about Costco than I should because of my frequent visits. There's a cosmetic section, which actually is one of their lower revenue businesses, where you can buy, you know. So this is going to replace that 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 and. It, Costco is hoping to make money from lab, the lab tests, the, the, the insurance payments that come from you going to the clinic. So read the case at the minimum, read the case, even if you don't plan to do it. But if you find that you can start working on it, especially on the discount rate part, get the you notes. Know, it, it's a group case. So it's the same group that you're doing your old, the overall project in. But much of the work you can start without having a, don't have a group meeting until you've all read the case and thought about the case, because otherwise it's just going to be, a, not much is going to be accomplished. So please do read that case when you get a chance. So today I want to complete our discussion of cost of capital. In fact, everything we've said so far has been about the cost of equity, right? In fact, we spent almost all of the last eight sessions talking about three ingredients, risk-free rate, which is going to be based on the currency you're in, your equity risk premium, which reflects the geographies you invest in, and the beta, which reflects the business choices you make. So the first place I would like you to spend some time on is take your company and compute a bottom-up beta, break it down to businesses. As I said, you're welcome to use the betas I've computed by business. If you want to do it on your own, all the more power to you and come up with the bottom-up beta. And if you're doing private private businesses, privately owned businesses as your company. Okay, but if you if any of you had, had privately owned businesses, you'd have had to do the extra step. Remember the one we took for Bookscape? We took the market beta, scaled it up. So that gives you your cost of equity for your company. But equity is only one way, one of two ways you can raise money as a company. So today I want to start the discussion by talking about the cost of debt. So if you think about the cost of capital, it comes from cost, you get raise some money from equity and you raise money from debt. So today I want to talk about the cost of debt, but before I do that, I'm going to do something strange. I'm going to define debt. You say, why would you want to do that? It's already in the balance sheet. Accountants tell me what debt is. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. So I'm going to start off by listing out the characteristics that make debt debt as opposed to equity. So let's go back, and this is one of the quiz questions on what makes equity the, the top of the pyramid? What is it about equity that gives them sup supremacy in, corp in corporate finance? They get a residual claim. They get whatever's left over, as opposed to what a contractual claim. You get whatever's left over. That is the first dividing line between equity and debt. Do I get a residual claim or do I get a contractual claim? First distinction. Second distinction. In much of the world, and we'll talk about the parts of the world where this is not true, the payments you make on debt are tax deductible, interest payments. But payments to equity, dividends, buybacks, have to come out of after-tax cash flows. So that's the second distinction. And third, if you fail to make those payments, something consequential and painful happens to you. Like what? Well, your knees might be broken if you borrow from the local money lender, but if you're a company, the equivalent of your knees being broken is you get pushed into bankruptcy. Your life as a company comes to an end. So contractual claim, tax deductible, loss of control of the organization if you don't make the payments. So what I'd like you to start thinking about is items on a balance sheet. I hope you've all seen at least one balance sheet in your life, but if you haven't, take your companies. And I want you to go item by item down that balance sheet, asking the question, forget about what it's called. Ask the question, is this debt? And perhaps then expand outside the balance sheet, are there items that should be on the balance sheet that should be treated as debt? So let's start easy. Corporate bonds. Contractual commitment. Uh, coupons are contractual commitment, tax deductible, interest payments are tax deductible. You fail to make those bond payments. The bondholders have the right to take over the company. Clearly that. Bank loans? Yes. How about short-term bank loans? 
the reason I drew that distinction, I'm surprised how often I see cost of capital computations done by people where they count only long-term debt. What are you trying to tell me? If I take a six-month loan, I don't have to pay it back? It'd be nice if I could get away with it. Short-term debt, long-term debt, interest-bearing debt, it's a no-brainer. It's always debt. Yes. You know what people justify? With the, they, they say equity is long-term. I'm going to count only the long. Equity, you have no choice. There's no short-term equity and long-term equity. I don't know what even goes through their heads when they do this, to be quite honest. All interest-bearing debt should always be debt. That's the easy part. Now, let me list a few other items off the balance sheet. You tell me whether they should be. How about accounts payable? Supplier credit. Should we count them as debt? What do you think? Let's pass it through the test. Is it a contractual claim? Yeah, right? The suppliers, that you got to pay it back. Is there an equivalent of an interest payment? It's implicitly there, right? Why? Because when a supplier sells you items on credit, unless he's stupid, he's going to give you some kind of sweetener to pay right away. He wants to pay paid right away. If you take 60 days, you usually get a discount of two, you know, if you pay right away, you get a 2% discount if you take the 60 days. Otherwise, he's lending you money at low. Here's the deal I'm willing to make with you. If you want, if you want to count accounts payable and supplier credit as debt, let's face it, some companies use this as equivalent to debt. You are borrowing money and the interest payments are implicit. They're in your cost of goods sold because you have a higher cost of goods sold because you did not use the discount. If you're willing to break out and tell me how much that discount is, then I'm willing to let you treat it. Now, do you see why it's almost never a good idea to count accounts payable and supply credit debt? debt? I mean, go to the cost of goods sold. How the heck are you going to figure out how much lost discount you had because you supply a credit? So accounts payable and supply credit are not debt, not because they're not contractual claims, but because the interest payments on that debt are implicit rather than explicit. So on the balance sheet, it's all interest-bearing debt. Until 2019, there was one big item off the balance sheet that didn't show up as debt on the balance sheet. I talked about Costco, 500 plus stores. Does Costco actually own the physical locations of these stores? It might own some of them, but most of them, what does it do? It leases them, short term or long term. It has to be long term. You build a big storage space. You have a one year lease. You can't keep jumping around. Let's say you take a 10 year lease. Somebody help me out here. So when Costco signs a lease agreement to put up a 150,000 square foot store, what, what does it look like? What does that contract look like that they agreed to pay 50 million a year for the next 10 years? Is that a contractual commitment? Tax deductible? Yeah, it shows up as part of the lease expense. And what happens if you fail to make a lease payment? Initially, you lose that store, right? They kick you out. But if you fail on a bunch of leases at the same time, you know, there are in fact two discount retailers, Caldor and Bradley's in the US that went bankrupt because they failed to make lease payment on a bunch of stores. Leases have always been debt. But for the longest time, accountants deliberately look the other way. It was the biggest source of off balance sheet debt. Again, there's no sensible rationale other than this is what we've always done and changing it will be too painful. The retailers will not write, like it. The restaurants will not like it. Accountants have always known it's a problem. How do I know? I found actually a panel discussion from 1949. Remember that day? From what was then the NYU School of Business, a panel discussion of accountants talking about how leases are debt and how they should be brought in the balance sheet, 1949. You know when they finally got around to doing something about it? 2019. So now when you look at your balance sheet, you'll see interest-bearing debt, but you'll also see lease debt. Finally, they've come to their senses. We'll talk about what accountants do to convert lease commitments to debt because it's something I've been doing for 30 years before accountants came to their senses, and it's not rocket science. Now, even if your accountants don't do it, 
you could still bring it on to the balance sheet as that. So let's talk about, once you've identified the debt, how you come up with the cost of debt. Remember that elaborate dance we went through to get to cost of equity? You had a beta, assumed investors were diversified, and then we come up with an equity risk premium. Cost of debt is far simpler. Here's what the cost of debt and a cost of capital should be. It should be the rate at which you borrow money long-term today. Two key words there, long-term and today. Even if all of your debt is one-year debt, I'm going to act like your debt is long-term. Do you know why, why we do that? Why can't I just give companies the cost of debt based on the maturity of the debt that they have? In most normal years, you go ahead. Well, that is part of it, you know, but if there's still your short-term debt and they're able to borrow at that short-term debt rate, why don't I give them the benefit of the fact that the short-term debt rate might be lower than the... Now, in most normal years, is the short-term debt rate lower or higher than the long-term debt rate? It's lower because the term structure is upward sloping. In, in the last 100 years in the U.S., in 88 of the 100 years, you had an upward sloping term structure. What does that mean? One-year rates are lower than 10-year rates. If I tell a company that their cost of debt would be based on the maturity of the debt they take on, you see the opening I've given CFOs to make their cost of capital look lower. They'll borrow one-year debt and say, look, our cost of debt is lower. So here's what I'm going to do to counter it. I'm saying, if you take one-year debt, then you've got to roll the debt over and that debt will have a different cost. The rolled over cost over 10 years, a one-year debt rolled over is going to be roughly equal to the 10-year rate. So I'm going to take that out of your hands and say, I don't care what, it actually makes your life easier. You're no longer checking the maturity of the debt. You're just taking a long-term cost and attaching it. The other word I used was today. Let's say your company, and this is probably very likely that many of your companies took on 10-year debt three years ago. And let's say it's a U.S. company. What's the rate on the debt going to look like if you took it three years ago? The T-bond rate was 1.5%. Default spreads are low. You probably borrowed it, 2.25%. That debt is still on your books, right? And companies are going to say, that's my cost of debt. That's what I'm actually paying. The T-bond rate right now is 4.1%. If I let you use a cost of debt of 2.25%, you're taking projects you should not be taking. So I'm going to replace that 2.25% with a, almost a hypothetical. If you borrowed the money today, what would you pay? And the answer is actually incredibly straightforward, right? What's the, what's the minimum that rate is going to be? If you're a company, you're borrowing long-term today in US dollars, it's going to be what? More than the T-bond rate, more than the risk-free rate, that's going to be your base, right? No company, no matter how large and how powerful and how safe, can borrow at less than the risk-free rate for a very simple reason, which is they can't print money, right? The government preserves that option, so you will always have some default risk, even a tiny bit. So to get to a cost of debt, I'm going to start with the risk-free rate, and add a credit spread or a default spread. We didn't invent this. I mean, I, you probably read that the Rothschild patriarch died a couple of days ago. You know when the Rothschilds first set up banks in Europe? Probably the 1400s, 1500s. Let's say you went into a Rothschild bank in 1505 and you tried to borrow money. They had some notion of what a guaranteed rate is. They probably didn't have a government bond, but that's some. And then they looked at you and what did they base the rate? They said, you have a wealthy father. Okay, there, that means my credit risk went down. How much did you make? In other words, as long as people have been lending money, they've assessed credit risk, the chance you will not pay them back and built that into a spread. Your job when you compute the cost of debt for your company is to act like the Rothschilds in 1505 and say, hey, what would the default spread be for this company? For some of your companies, for many of your companies, you will get lucky. Some outside entity might have done this dirty work for you and told you this company is not that risky or very risky. What am I talking about? What are the outside entities that gauge credit risk? Ratings agencies, S&P, Moody's, Fitch. Is there a cost to, 
to trusting them? Of course, because they can screw up. But think of how much time they've saved you. And if you've looked at ratings, they go, it's alphabetical. It goes from AAA, which is the safest company you that, that they've found, all the way down to D, which means you're in default. So when they tell you a company is rated triple B and you trust them, you're well on your way to assessing a default spread. And here's what. Bonds trade. And you can track what the default spread is by ratings class. And I'll send you a link to a site that, that actually updates it at the start of every month by rating. It's actually a national insurance corporation. They basically track this because their their clients need to know. So you can tell me, if you tell me your triple B rate, I can tell you that default spread to be 1.43%. That's what typically triple B rate. And you're done, right? You take the risk-free rate, you add 1.43%, you get a cost of debt. So if your company has a rating, and I gave you the Bloomberg page that actually has the ratings for your company, it's actually overkill. They give you Moody's, S&P, Fitch. They even give you their own assessment of default risk. That becomes the basis for your default spread. But some of you might not be lucky. You might have picked a smaller company, an emerging market company that is not rated. And you say, what do I do now? I'm going to suggest a pathway that's going to sound incredibly complicated, but we're going to see it's not that complicated. Act like your Moody's or S&P and rate the company. You see, no, I don't have the resources. You're going to be surprised at how little goes into a rating, how little information there is in a rating how easy it is to replicate ratings. And I'll take you through the process of estimating what, what I call a synthetic rating. I call it synthetic because it's not a Moody's rating. It's you acting like Moody's and saying, this is what your rating would be as a company. And in doing all of this, remember, you already made a currency choice, right? When you did your cost of equity, stick with that same currency choice. So if you chose to analyze your company in U.S. dollars, your cost of debt also has to be in U.S. dollars, no matter what currency they're borrowing. So let's get that process rolling by starting with the easy companies in my, in my list. In my list, three of my companies had S&P ratings. I mean, how do you pick between S&P and Moody's? 99%. This is not like ESG ratings, so they disagree wildly. Bond ratings, you will almost never find a company where you get a double A rating from S&P and a double B rating from Moody's. The ratings will be within a notch or two of each other almost all of the time. So pick your ratings agency, if you have multiple ones, and just take the rating. So two of my companies at single A ratings, Vale and an A minus rating. I'll come back and talk more about Vale, but these were S&P ratings for the company based on everything S&P claims to bring. If you ask S&P, do you lose a lot of resources? What do you think their answer is going to be? Immense amounts. We have people who meet. We have meetings with management. They claim to be incredibly information-based, but we'll strip that delusion very quickly, but that's what they claim to do. But it's true, they, are, they do spend their entire lives estimating this rating. So let's take that rating as trustworthy. Here's how I use it. For in 2013, the default spread for A-rated bonds was about 1%. And for A-rated bonds was 1.3%. I add that on to my risk-free rate, depending on whatever currency I do it in. Default spreads... In a sense, whatever market you get, go on top of your risk premium. Like equity risk premiums, you don't have to worry about it. This is a dollar spread. Can I add, add it to a euro risk free rate? You can get away with it because the rates are pretty close. You add the default spread to the risk free rate, I get a cost of debt, free tax. We'll talk about where the post tax will come in for each of the three companies. And if I wanted to convert Vale's cost of debt to RIAs, remember we did this with the cost of equity? I use exactly the same process. I take the 4.5% cost of debt in RIA terms, take the inflation difference of 7%, and I can scale it up to a RIA cost of debt. So any questions for companies with ratings on how to use the ratings? Basically, look up the default spread, and I'll send you the table for the lookup. It obviously will change over time. And we'll talk about what might cause those changes, but that's for the companies that have ratings. See, what if my company does, yes. If it were different, 
remember you as a company choose to borrow money. Let's say the cost from a bank is 5%. The cost from a loan is 4.5%. You get to pick, right? Nobody forces you to borrow. So if you have different costs of borrowing, the bank is charging a higher rate, guess what you're going to do? You're going to go to the bond market. Observing what a company does often will give you a sense of what is my cost of debt. Right? So we're making that assumption, but it's a pretty safe one because no company in its right mind should be borrowing at the higher rate. Yes. It's a dollar spread. It doesn't even have to be US-based, right? Many of these bonds are foreign company bonds. They trade. The default spread is just the difference between the yield to maturity on a bond and whatever the risk free rate is. So I could take Europe, European companies, which have ratings, compute the spreads. It looks very similar because if it looked different, guess what European companies would do? They'd go to the US and borrow money. So again, it's the same argument of companies have choices. Default spreads can't be wildly different across different parts of the world because you just go wherever the money's cheapest. So any, any questions on the rating and the default spread? Let's talk about what to do with companies where you don't have a rating. When I first asked this question, it was like 30 years ago. And I said, well, no, I, I want to be a ratings agency. How would I rate a company? And ratings agencies are the most transparent organizations in the world, not because they want to be, but because of what the output from a ratings agency is. Think about it. What do ratings agencies provide as output to them? What, what do we observe? We observe the ratings of every company they rate, right? It's public information. So I downloaded every company that was rated then in 1993 when i did this 90% of companies were rated were us companies now it's more 50 50 it's amazing how many emerging market companies have ratings i i had my first column in my excel spreadsheet I had the name of the company in the second column i had the rating and then the rating agencies give away the game S P on its ratings page actually used to list out the eight accounting ratios that they used to rate companies so in your accounting class, you probably saw the interest coverage ratio, EBITDA to fixed charges, debt to capital. I downloaded those eight ratios into the next eight columns. Now I have 1,500 companies, the rating in the second column, and eight ratios in the next eight. And then I did some reverse engineering. What do you think my reverse engineering involved? But eight, 1,700 lines, you get dizzy, right? So basically, how did I use the fact that it was in a spreadsheet to do the reverse engineering? You can actually sort by rating, or you can do a pivot table by rating if you've never used an amazing feature in Excel. And you can see what a low number on a ratio was a high. You can also look at the correlation between ratings and ratios, right? What are you trying to answer? Which of these eight ratios is carrying the weight that ex best explains the difference in ratings and which are along for the ride? And for non-financial service companies, financial service companies are a different beast altogether because as I said, debt is not capital, it's raw material. But for non-financial service companies, half of all the differences in ratings can be explained by one ratio. It's called the interest coverage ratio. For those of you in your accounting, you remember that's the Earnings before interest and taxes divided by the interest expense. So think like a lender. When you lend to a company, do you want this number to be a high number or a low number? You want it to be as high a number as possible, right? You want a lot of buffer built in. An interest coverage ratio of 10 means you're earning $10 of earnings for every dollar of interest expense. If you can tell me what your interest coverage ratio is, I can guess your rating. See, so what about the other seven ratios? Adding the other seven ratios explains another 10 or 15% of the difference in ratings. And of course, that leaves 35%. You're saying, what is that 35%? Sometimes it's averaging income over time. It's sometimes the sector in which a company is. If I were a fixed income trader, thank God I'm not, then I want ratings that are precise. But I want a cost of capital. If I'm within shouting distance of a true rating, I can live with it. So I built my entire ratings process around this one ratio. So here's what the ratio looks like for my five companies. Disney had the highest ratio. It's a base based just on the interest coverage ratio. It looks like the safest of the companies. And Tata Motors had the lowest of the interest coverage ratios, the riskiest of the companies. 
But by itself, the interest coverage ratio doesn't give me a cost of debt. I have to convert it into a rating. So I have a lookup table that I update every year. The latest version is on my spreadsheet. I'll send you the link. Where if you tell me what your interest coverage ratio is and whether you're a large company or a small company, why does that matter that you're a large company or a small company thing? It's not fair, but ratings agencies seem to have two sets of rules. If you're a small company, you need to deliver a much higher interest coverage ratio to get the same rating. Why? Because you're small. So in this case, large or small is defined in market cap terms and 5 billion is my cutoff. So most of your companies will be large companies. You go to the first column, you tell me what your interest coverage ratio is, I'll look up the rating. So let's take Disney. 22.57, clearly it's well above 8.5. My synthetic rating for Disney is AAA. Vale, large cap company, 11.67, but it's an emerging market company. For emerging market companies, I do use the riskier table because for better or worse, even if you're a large company in an emerging market, again, two sets of rules, developed markets, emerging markets. Companies complain about this all the time, but it is what it is. So Vale, I get a double A rating because I use the second, small cap or risky. Tata Motors, large cap emerging, 4.51. They barely make it, but they're an A minus rated company. They're just 0.01 notches from being triple B, at least on my table. Baidu, small cap emerging market companies, 23.72, triple A rating. Part of you saying, who'd give a triple A rating for a tech company? I'll come back and talk about why you don't want to exhaust your resources trying to answer that question here. But at the end of this process, including my private business, Bookscape, I have a synthetic rating for the company. The fact that a private small business would never be rated is irrelevant. The rating is a means to an end for me. It's to get a default spread, and I have the basis for the default spread. Now, remember, three of those companies had actual ratings. So I was curious about whether my synthetic ratings process was delivering a rating close to the actual rating. For Disney, my synthetic rating was AAA. The actual rating was single A. I was giving them a much higher rating. And the answer was actually surprisingly easy to find. I was basing my interest coverage ratio on the most recent year's operating income. As a lender, when you lend to a company, you look at the most recent year, but is it's prudent to look at what you did last year too, because your income, if you're an oil company, your earnings can go up and down. Lenders often lend based on what do you make over a period of time? What's your average income? What's your normal income? And if I use the average operating income over the last five years for Disney instead of the last year's income, that difference disappears. I'm going to still use the single A rating. I'm not going to, but I can explain why my synthetic. You saying, what about Vale? Why are you getting a double A rating? There, the answer is a little more subtle. Until I think 2001, ratings agencies used to have what's called a rating ceiling. You know what a rating ceiling is? No company in a country could ever get a rating higher than the country in which it was incredibly unfair. Imagine being trapped in Venezuela as a company, right? What's the highest rating you can get? C, C, C double A, say, you know, what is C1, C2, something like that, whatever the country rating is, or Sri Lanka. You're going to be trapped. And it's unfair because you can think of companies that are able to escape from because maybe there are oil companies in that country. They can sell into a global market. So they've relaxed that country's ceiling, but it's still part of the ratings process. What does that mean? When S&P rated Vale, they factored in that it was a Brazilian company, which meant that I, even though they might have liked the numbers, they've lowered it. That B minus already reflects country risk. You have a question? No? Okay. And finally, and for Deutsche Bank, it has an A rating. I didn't even try to get a synthetic rating. When financial service companies just hope and pray the ratings agency has it right. Who knows what actually goes in? If you really want to explain, you can bring in regulatory capital ratios, maybe other elements of risk. But at least I can explain the difference between actual and synthetic ratings. So now I have all of my companies. For the three companies with ratings, I'm going to leave the actual rating. For the two companies in my list, which did not have ratings, I used the synthetic rating, okay? So if you look at um, if you look at Bookscape, the default spread I got from the synthetic rating was 1.3%. You add that on to the risk-free rate, the T-bond rate, because I was doing things in dollars, you come up with a risk-free rate of 4.05%. That's your pre-tax cost of debt. 
But remember we said interest is tax deductible in much of the world. What are the parts of the world where it's not tax deductible, interest expenses? Primarily the Middle East. And the reason is actually religious as opposed to economic because in Islamic finance, interest expenses are, you know, are sinful. So basically, if you have interest expenses, you don't get a tax deduction. That's the only part of the world that, no. But Indonesia, which is the last largest Muslim country, interest is still tax deductible. So don't just assume because you have, you know, a country where it might be frowned upon that you're not going to get a tax benefit. Much of the world you get a tax benefit. And here's how the interest tax benefit works. I'm just finishing up my taxes for this year. It's due April 15th, and I wanted to get a jump on it. And I'm sure many of you have to do your taxes, even if it's to get a credit or whatever you're getting. Think of how your taxes work. You report all your income, comes up with an adjusted gross income, and then you subtract out deductions. Much more difficult now than it used to be, but if you have interest payments on your house, you deduct it from your income. So let's say you have a million dollars in income. If I'm insulting you by understating your potential income, add an extra zero if you want, right? Let's say you have a million dollars in income and you have $100,000 in interest expenses. Think of where you saved on taxes. You take the million, you subtract out the 100,000, you report 900,000 in taxable income, you pay taxes on the 900,000. You're saying, so what? The taxes you save are at the margin on your last $100,000. And the reason I bring that up is there are two tax rates you run into in corporate finance. One is the effective tax rate, which is an average tax rate you pay across all your income. Every company reports it. And the other is a marginal tax rate, which comes right out of the tax code. How many of you plan to live and work in New York after you get your MBA? Okay. I'm going to give you some really depressing news about marginal tax rates in New York City, right? Now we're talking about, so let's say you go to work for an investment bank, you make $250,000. Congratulations, you've hit gold. And let's make it $600,000. You know, you got that really lucrative top job right off that. At $600,000, tell me what your marginal tax rate will look like. Remember, it comes from the tax court. So what's the first hit you take? What's a federal corporate a federal income tax rate at a six hundred thousand dollar income? You think it's thirty seven, right? It used to be thirty nine point six. It became so it's thirty seven percent plus three point six percent for Medicare taxes, which now applies to. So basically, it's about forty percent of the federal tax. Wait, there's more coming. You're in New York State. You know the marginal tax rate at six hundred thousand dollars is. It's eight and a half percent. And it's no longer tax deductible. So it's on top of the, four, so 48 and a half percent. Wait, I'm not done with you yet. You plan to live in New York City or do you plan to live? I, I assume that you have to, if you work in the city, you're going to be treated as a city. I mean, so if you live in the city, you have an extra three and a half percent. So you know, bumping into what, 51, 52%. It's only a matter of time before Chelsea decides Hey, you want to live here? That's an extra 1%. It's coming down the pike. So your marginal tax rate is about 52 to 53%. When you borrow money at 6%, you're really not borrowing money at 6% because that 6%, if it's tax deductible, will effectively become 3%. It's tricky with individual taxes now because they put a cap on how much you can deduct in, this was the 2017 tax law. So I don't even know whether you get the full tax benefit, but that is why the marginal tax rate matters. If you're a corporation, the federal corporate tax rate. Now, anybody want to get, estimate, tell me what that number is? What's the federal corporate tax rate? It's 21%. It used to be 35% until 2017. So the tax rate, so we'll talk about the consequences for tax benefits from debt, but it's gone from 35 to 21%. But as with individuals, you have state and local taxes, depending on the state you're in. Roughly speaking, the marginal tax rate for a US company now is about 
He's saying, why are you using 40%? This was in 2013 when the federal corporate tax, federal tax rate was 35%. You add the state and local taxes, you're very quickly going to hit 40%. That's what I used for bookscapes after tax cost of debt. That's what I would use for any US company that borrows money in the US. That tax rate will be the same across the board. You're saying, what if I'm in a different country? The corporate tax rate will be different. You got to check what it is. If you go to my website, I have corporate tax rates listed by country. I would love to claim the credit for doing this, but I stole this from the PwC. They must have some group whose life it is to go check corp tax codes. Can you imagine how boring that job must be? You must have to be able to use Google Translator because some of the tax code is going to be in Romanian, Hungarian. But they do all the work. I steal the, I give them credit, they credit to PwC. I used to steal it from KPMG, but they seem to have stopped. Maybe they fired the entire group because they didn't want the cost. So you can find the tax rate for every country. That is going to become the tax rate used on your cost of debt. So for the three companies with ratings, I use the marginal tax rates for each of the countries. 36.1% was the marginal tax rate for Disney. You think, how do you get so precise? Disney actually in their footnotes, not every company does it, specified what their tax rate was at the federal, the state, the local level. So 36.1% marginal tax rate. Deutsche, the marginal tax rate I used was the German marginal tax rate. The corporate tax rate was 29.48%. And for Vale, I used the Brazilian marginal tax rate, which is 34%. For Tata Motors, I used the synthetic rating, but I had to add, I had to add one more component to the cost of debt. For every company that, that you see there, it's risk-free rate plus default spread, right? For the company. With Tata Motors, I started with the risk-free rate, but to come up with the default spread, I used the default spread that I got from looking at the company and its rating. And to it, I added the default spread of the country. Tata Motors does have a rating by the 2013. Now it has a rating from S&P and Moody's, but then it had a rating from an Indian ratings agency called Chrysler, but Chrysler rates companies in India. So when you get a AAA rated company from Chrysler, you're basically getting a rate. It, remember, things are relative. So when I get a rating from Chrysler or computer synthetic rating for, for um, Toyota Motors, I'm computing what the company default spread will be. I add the country default spread to that company default spread. Remember the, the country default spread I took out of the government bond rate? It goes back in. Why? Because you cannot escape the taint that comes from being in a risky country when you go to borrow money. Imagine being a Greek company walking into a bank in 2012 and saying, I want to borrow money. The bank is going to say, it's going to be at least 30%. So I haven't even shown you my financials. No, 30% plus. Why? Because when bankers lend, when you issue corporate bonds, your country of incorporation taints your cost of debt. Sometimes you're able to escape some of that taint, but here I'm adding the entire country. So my cost of debt in repeat terms is 9.62%. The marginal tax rate in India then was 32.45%. I've got my after-tax cost of debt. And you can see the driver of the cost of debt is the default spread. The default spread changes over time. In this graph, you actually can see between 2020 and 2024, how much it's changed on a year-to-year -year basis. So if you look across time, 2020, especially if you look at 20, uh, at the jump in spreads, and I, I know it goes, in 2023, default spreads jump across the board and more so for lower rated companies. What happened in 2023? Inflation came back. Inflation comes back. It turns out that lenders start to worry more default. So when you do your cost of debt for your company, you want a current default spread. I have the January 2024 spreads. They haven't changed much. If you use them, it's not the end of the world, but I'll give you a way of updating those numbers because it is something that you want to track. Now, can default spreads change during the course of a year? Absolutely. In some years. 2020, default spread at the start of the year. Default spread three months later. Take a look at it. They're a triple B rated company. The default spread at the start of the year was one and a half percent. The default spread three months later was almost 4%. You say, what happened? COVID happened. And if you remember, I showed you the equity risk premiums in the and the equity risk premium also went up. And 
that shouldn't be a surprise, right? Because what's driving risk premiums? It's fear. If fear is hitting the equity market, fear is also hitting the bond market. So you're going to see this up and down in crisis periods of default spreads, which means your rating might not change as a company. But if you're in a crisis, your cost of debt just went up because the default spreads are wide. I hope and pray you don't have a crisis between now and May, because then you definitely cannot use the January 2024 spreads. But that's the advantage of being able to update these spreads. So what I'd like you to do for your company is check first if, that, if it has a rating. If it has a rating, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Take the default spread based on the rating, add it to the risk-free rate, come up with the cost of debt. Look up the marginal tax rate, come up with an after-tax cost of debt. If you don't have a rating, it's a little messier. Take the interest coverage ratio, go to the lookup table, estimate a synthetic rating, get a default spread. If you're in a risky country, don't forget to add the country default spread as well. And you essentially should have a cost of debt for any company. Now, earlier I said, I'm not going to make a big fuss about the fact that I got a AAA rating for Baidu. And I think there are only what, a handful of AAA rated companies left in the world. None of them is a technology company. It might surprise you saying, how come Apple doesn't have a AAA rating? It's just a deeper version S&P and Moody's have to risky companies and tech is still viewed as risky. You know why I, I'm not going to lose much sleep over the fact that Baidu is probably not going to be AAA rated? What do I do with the cost of debt? I bring it into a cost of capital calculation and I multiply the after-tax cost of debt by the debt ratio. Now, whether you remember, but Baidu has about a 5% debt ratio. You have a 5% debt ratio. Does it really matter whether your rating is AAA or single A? It don't, doesn't change your cost of capital. Focus your time and resource on the things that matter. This ain't one of them. So you can get a synthetic rating for a tech company. It's probably going to be a little too high given what you would actually expect to see. But rather than finessing it, take it and run with it because it's not going to make a heck of a difference to your cost of capital. So that's, yeah, go ahead. Think like a banker, right? So forget about all of corporate finance. You're a banker. And I come to borrow money from you, right? Coca-Cola, I come to borrow money. And right behind me is MBEP, Brazilian company. Let's have financials look exactly the same. Same interest coverage in every ratio. Are you? And let's say what you're lending in US dollars, so there's no currency difference. Will you lend to both of us at the same dollar cost of debt? That's really the question that we have to confront. And the answer across much of the world is no, for a bunch of reasons. One is, if you don't make your debt payments and your Coca-Cola, I sue you in a US court, I tried to, there's a differences in laws, regulations, in a, all kinds of things that get in the way. So it's unfair because it means that if you're in a risky country, you start off at a disadvantage but it is what it is, and that's what you're trying to incorporate into the cost of debt. It's purely pragmatic. There's no theory that drives it. It's the reality that lenders charge more if you're from a risky country. It's not like it's not the risk of default per se. It's only it is if the country goes to hell in a handbasket. That's what the default spread is. The companies in that country have no way of completely escaping the consequences, right? So I think that is the reality you face as a lender is I have to factor that in when I lend to them because it's not the company's fault that the country goes under, but the company is going to have trouble. You might have restrictions on foreign exchange. You can't make payments. So there are all kinds of issues that come up in a country defaults. Now, so far I've talked about two ways. You had a question? Yeah. All ratings, if a company already rate is rated, then you don't have to add the, so that's a good point. The reason I did not add a Brazil default spread to my Vale cost of debt is that was an S&P rating. Ratings already incorporate country risk. Well or badly, I don't know, but it's already there. So if you have an actual rating, don't add a country default spread. Yes, Gandharu. Yeah. I'd say starter motor, so I, I don't even know what the, what the actual symbol is. So you know, it's just a separate company from country. That's basically all I did. So, yeah. Well, yeah, this is joined by the weird double box. 
No, no. So basically, I if this that were an S and P rating for Tata Motors, I would not have add, added the country. So if S and P had told me that's single A rated, I'd have said, okay, I'm done. But to the fact that this came from Chrysler, it's a rating that reflects an Indian assessment of relative risk. I had to bring in the Indian country risk. So if you look at every Indian company that is both an S&P and a Chrysler rating, you'll notice the Chrysler ratings are always higher than the S&P ratings, not because Chrysler is doing something weird, but because their universe is just Indian companies. Yes. That's right. Equity markets, that's the difference. In debt, debt, you're very focused, right? Which is about debt payments. Am I going to get my payments? So it's a much more focused exercise. And the fact that you're in other countries re might reduce it. That's why I said sometimes you can escape the full pain of country risk. If you're an oil company that gets 80% of your revenues outside Nigeria, you might not. But even that, that taint of Nigerian country risk is going to stay even though you, so you could get 100% of your revenues outside Nigeria, but I'm still going to charge you a Nigerian country default spread. So if you're, in, if you're wondering why I don't take a weighted average of the countries you're in, it's because debt markets behave very differently than equity markets. The kind of claim you have is very different. The things you worry about are very different as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's entirely about will I get paid, right? Equity, get all the, the the dreams waving around. There's lots of growth in those countries. Here, there's not no upside. So basically, I bring in the downside. Well, that part of the, that part of the business goes under, right? It doesn't drag down the rest of the the company. So if I have a sin. The country of incorporation, there's a, there is that argument that maybe the country of incorporation matters more. And in some businesses, they matter more because I can't move the company. An oil company, that's why we looked at where do you get your oil? Because you know what? I, I can't escape that. But if you're Infosys and India goes to hell in a handbasket, I'm not making any predictions. I don't want this to go out on Twitter. But just as a hypothetical, Infosys has the choice of saying incorporation is a legal decision, right? Can Infosys reincorporate in, I don't know, Mauritius? Yeah, I don't see why not. You, know, you put 300 software engineers on a plane, you send them off somewhere. It's why I think manufacturing and natural resource companies worry more about country of incorporation than if you're a company that can essentially move your resource. It does create an incentive for companies that can do that to move away from risky countries because why bear this burden on your cost of debt? So they must be getting a benefit from being incorporated in that country as well that outweighs this cost. Yes. In fact, th that's the final loose end I want to tie up. So far, I've said there are only two ways to raise money, debt and equity. But there is a third way, which is a mix of the two. They're hybrids. I call them cross-dressing securities. Basically, they're part debt, part equity. Let's take the most common one, convertible debt. What is convertible debt? Convertible debt looks like regular debt, right? There's a face value, there's interest payments, but what's the convertible part of it? Do, what, what do I get the right in a convertible bond that I don't get with the traditional bond? I can convert it to equity. At a, so basically, there's an option embedded in it. That option is equity. So convertible debt is part debt, part equity. And if you had a company with convertible debt, I would strongly suggest you break out the debt part, throw it into debt, take out the conversion option, throw it into equity. It's good to have only two components of cost of capital. Later in the class, we'll talk about why. That takes care of convertible debt. Yes. Uh, just to clarify, you're yeah. spending a lot of time The, not the hybrid part, but the cost of debt. But the, yeah. When you say all of this, the only part you're skipping is actually, no, you still need a default spread. You still have to worry about all those things. And if you're in a risky country and you have a rating, you would dispense with the need to add the country default spread because it's already in your rating. Yeah. But you're trusting the ratings agency then. That's the cost of trusting an actual rating is if they screw up, your cost of debt is going to be messed up as well. How much do you 
I'll tell you, I know that there's a very cynical view of ratings agencies as biased. And I think ratings, ratings agencies, my biggest problem with is they're late to the party every single time. And there's a reason for that. They're bureaucracies, right? To change a rating, you have a committee, committees meet and meet and meet. They told us Greece was risky in 2011. If you track that crisis, Greece got risky in 2009. They've stopped rating Russia. They might give us a rating in 2027, but by then, who cares? My problem with ratings agencies is there's, is there sometimes, so the, the companies we should worry about the rating are companies where something big has happened recently, usually big and bad, because the rating you're going to see for the company probably doesn't reflect it yet. It will one day. So check your company. If something happened in the end of 2023 that caused the company to go into into some kind of trouble, your rating probably doesn't reflect it. The rest of the time, ratings ratings are, pr are pretty good. Pretty good for, you know, the correlation between ratings and actual default, when you look at the tables, is extremely high. Because there's that, I know it's probably Hollywood, yeah. that scene in the big short where I think about where they went when in the middle start of the crisis. Oh, well, there's all kinds of incentives. People try to sell the ratings agency and giving them a higher rating. They would dress things up. And in good times, They'll probably get away with it. I mean, I think part of it was we were all caught up. Why did people pay higher prices for houses? There was no rating there. But basically, if people believe that housing prices will keep going up, everything is going to get contaminated by that view. So I, I this notion that ratings agencies just, you know, will give you a, there are periods where ratings agencies consistently underrate companies. Right? 2023, they're probably a lot more downgrades than they should have been because they thought a recession was coming. They started downgrading companies. So mistakes cut both directions here. So easy one is convertible debt. Yeah. You could. I think you're, uh, the broader question you're asking is, do I just get one shot at estimating the cost of debt or is this a number that could change over time? The answer is absolutely, right? And it's not just the ratings. Your debt ratio could change over time. So everything is in motion. This is about getting a starting number at least. And then we can talk about what happens at number over time. So convertible bonds, break it down to then. There's another type of financing that I absolutely hate when I see it in my company. It's preferred stock. In the US, preferred stock is just very expensive debt. Let me explain what I mean. In Latin America, preferred stock is actually non-voting common stock. So when you see Brazilian preferred stock, no. In the U.S., when you issue preferred stock, it comes with a fixed dividend. Like, so like a bond, there's a coupon that's set. There's a price to the preferred stock, and you can get a preferred dividend yield. And you're saying, why is it expensive debt? With debt, what was the big plus we got after we made interest payments? It's tax deductible. Preferred stock, preferred dividends are not tax deductible. It's insane that you would actually issue preferred stocks. So why do companies use it? I'll give you the sector where you're going to see preferred stocks show up most frequently. And maybe you can you know, think about why they do it. Banks are the biggest issuers of preferred stock in the U.S. What is it about banks? No. Because... The regulatory capital that governs banks, you're allowed to include preferred stock as part of the regulatory capital. So it's expensive debt, but it allows them to meet capital requirements. It's, it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy because it drains your earnings. You don't get the tax benefit. But if you have preferred stock, and if it's small, cover one eye or both eyes and act like you don't see it. So if it's less than 5% of the capital, act like it's not there. But it's 15, 20, 25 percent of capital. You have no choice but to open a third segment. Debt, equity, preferred stock, and the preferred dividend yield will become the cost of preferred stock. No, don't put a one minus T on it. There's no tax benefit. So that's hybrids. And when you're done with all of this, you essentially have the starting at least for coming up with the weights for the cost of capital. So I'm going to state what is a corporate finance first principle, but it gets an amazing amount of pushback. The weights you're supposed to use to get a cost of capital are market value weights, as opposed to what, what you see on the, on the books, right? Shareholders equity in a balance sheet. So you want market value of equity, market value of debt, 
And the reason I say we get a lot of pushback is half of all companies out there actually compute their cost of capital using book value weights. The market value weights make sense because you think about raising equity and raising debt. You raise them at market values. Who does it at book value? So I want to take you through some of the reasoning I've heard from CFOs for why they use book value and what the pushback should be, because you're going to hear the same reason. The first is that book value is more reliable than market value. You know why? Because it doesn't change as much. The oddest rationale I've ever heard. How often does book value change? Once every three months, right? So why don't you make the accountant come once every year? It'll make it even more reliable. But let's dispense. Let's make the accountant stop coming in. Your book value will... This is an absurd definition of reliable. It doesn't change because nobody's even trying. So take that off the list. Second is that using book value that in most companies, remember CFOs are account recovering accountants or ex-accountants. They still think in accounting terms. They say, we're just being conservative. That's why we use book value. But think about it. If you use book value of debt and book value of equity to get weights and cost of capital as opposed to market value, Typical U.S. company trades at about three to four times book value. So when you use market value, equity is going to be a higher number. Debt's going to be a lower number. Your debt ratio is going to be low. Your equity ratio is going to be high. When I switch to book value, it's going to be the reverse. You're saying, so what? Debt is cheaper than equity. When I replace market value weights with book value weights, and you can try this for your company, I will lower the cost of capital for my company. And I'm now using it as my hurdle rate for projects. That doesn't strike me as conservative. There's a third defense, which is there's one place in finance where we use book values, which is in computing accounting returns, return on equity, return on investment capital. And with this weird consistency logic, accounts say, if you use book value for returns, you should use book value for cost of capital. No, cost of capital. I still have to raise the money. There is no good reason for using book value, even a remotely good reason. You should use market value. Should the, could those weights change over time? Absolutely. As Guillermo pointed out, your weight with debt can be 0% today. It can be 30% 10 years from now, but it should be market value weights. Now, this calculation was in 2013, when, as I said, you know, accountants had still not come to their senses. They were still treating leases as not debt. So I'll take you through the process of how to convert leases to debt, but first I want to can compute the market value of debt for Disney. Because market value of equity is going to be easy for a publicly traded company. You think, what's so difficult about, why don't you just look up what the market value is? You can do it for bonds, right? But even a company like Disney that raises a large portion of its debt from bonds also has bank loans. And bank loans never get marked to market. Getting market value of debt is much, much more difficult than getting market value of equity. So guess what most investment banks do when it comes to computing cost of capital? They use market value of equity. It's easy. But then for market value of debt, they do a little dance. It's too difficult. We can't observe it. And they use the book value of debt as a proxy. I don't have a problem with it. But you can see the kinds of companies where it's going to get you into trouble. Most companies' book and market debt are not going to be that different. But if you have a company that took a lot of debt in 2021, the book debt is going to be very different from market debt. And here's how you can, you can check. I took, uh, I, I looked at Disney, Disney's footnotes and they told me that the weighted average maturity of the debt was about 7.9 years. We'll see in a minute why that matters. So you, most companies in their footnotes will give you this. I actually gave you the Bloomberg page that gives you this weighted average for your company. On their books, they had book value of debt of 14.288 billion. So that was the interest bearing debt of the balance sheet, the book value. And in their income statement, they gave me what the interest expense on the debt was, 349 million. Let's play a little game. Let's assume that this is a gigantic coupon bond with a 7.92 year maturity, a $14,288 million face value, and a coupon of $349 million a year. Can I compute the market price of a bond? What do we do? We take the present value of the coupons. If you're wondering what this strange looking equation is, that's what the present value button on your calculator does when you hit payment N and R. So basically, if you don't like that equation, just hit payment N and R, you'll get the same number. I'm taking the se- the 349 million every year for 7.92 years and the 14,288 million at the end of the 10 uh, the end of the seven uh, the end of 7.92 years and I'm discounting them back 
at the pre-tax cost of debt, I computed using the rating, 3.75%. What I get as a present value is 13.028 billion. I've converted the book debt into market debt. And I've done it on a consolidated basis. So I'm not driving myself crazy. You can take any company and at least try this out. See how different it is. It might be that it's very close. And you can say, I'm okay. Or maybe your company doesn't report the maturity of your debt, in which case you have no choice but to use book value. But there's a way to convert book value to market value that somehow, you know, seems to escape the attention of the people trying to do it. But in 2013, leases were not treated as debt. And that, as I said, it's always struck me as weird that you don't treat it as debt. But U.S. companies have been required to report their lease commitments for as long as I remember in the footnotes. So I went to Disney's footnotes and they gave me my lease commitment, their lease commitments for the next five years and beyond year five. Beyond year five, you just report a lump sum. I've kind of leveled it off over time. I take the present value of the lease commitments using my pre-tax cost of debt as my discount rate. Why pre-tax? Because these commitments are pre-tax commitments. What I get as a present value is 2.93 billion. I brought that onto the balance sheet as lease debt, which means my total debt for Disney is not the 13.03 billion that you saw on the previous page as market value of interest bearing debt. It's plus the 2.9 billion. So my total debt for Disney, and from this point on, you're going to see this number show up again and again, is 15.96 billion. And it includes lease commitments as debt. The difference is in 2013, I had to do this. Now accountants do it for you. Yes. So then just to clarify, yeah. these slides back where we're giving calculations of interest bearing debt, the reason we specify interest bearing is because the leases are not in that category. Exactly. It's essentially just debt without leases. It's like a term loan that's not called a term loan, right? Gotcha. Yeah, so that's always been the excuse that accountants gave is it's it's messy. We don't we know if I, if I gave you a term loan, you could break out an imputed interest expense and a principal repayment. We do this um, with the mortgages all the time to get a tax deduction. So that's partly why I keep it separate, because at least in 2019, I had no choice. This was the only way to bring it on. But today, as I said, accountants are bringing it on to balance sheet. So when you look at your company's balance sheet and we qualify that. IFRS and GAAP require this now. Okay? Much of the rest of the world were still in kind of this middle ground. Eventually, it might show up as debt. So I actually continue to use my way of computing the present value of leases as debt and comparing it to the accounting number. In the US, I, I, my debt is about 18% higher than the accounting number, partly because accountants still allow some escape clauses or debt leases cancelable. You don't have to count it as debt. I count all these commitments. In Europe, I get 50, my debt is about 50% higher than the accounting debt. In Asia, my debt is eight to 10 times higher than what you see as least debt on the balance sheet, which tells me that in Asia, there are either lots of accounting systems that don't require leases be shown as debt or too many escape hatches where companies are able to evade it. Don't, I mean, it doesn't matter what accountants do. This is about you doing the right thing. So if the commitments are there, you should be able to compute the debt. So what I'd like you to do is take your company, go through the balance sheet, go through that test, as it said, take the interest bearing debt. You'll have the book value. If you can get the maturity and the interest payment, compute the estimated market value. Take the lease debt and just for yourself, check because you still they still report the commitments at the bottom. So you can check the accounting numbers, see how close you get. Don't trust the accountants to do it right because who knows what they've left out in their calculation. So remind me again why leases are debt? Because they're contractual commitments, right? Do you see the can we've opened up here? Any contractual commitment, no matter what you call it, is debt. In 2021, Netflix got the rights to Seinfeld. You know, quintessential. This is a show that's been around. I mean, I've watched pretty much every Seinfeld episode five times. But it's a show that people come back to watch. They paid $500 million for the rights to the Seinfeld show for the next five years, $100 million every year. Contractual commitment? Absolutely. Tax deductible, yes. They can treat this as an expense. And if you fail to make the commitment, they'll yank the show from you. Maybe you won't go bankrupt, but there's still a consequence. 
If you go to the Netflix financial statements, in the footnotes, they have lease commitments, and right next to it, they have content commitments. That's Seinfeld short. You probably read about the Dodgers signing Shohei Atani to $700 million contract. Contractual? No, absolutely contractually commitment. The, the Dodgers just took on probably a $450 million loan. Well, you know why it's so much lower than the $700 million? What is it about the contract that makes the market value of it so much lower? Because he's getting $2 million a year for the next 10 years and $690 million at the end of the 10th year. Why is he doing it? Tax reasons. And okay. but, but from a present value standpoint, this is why we compute market value, right? So when you think about leases, think about other contractual commitments. And your company will report those. Those are effectively dead if they're not escapable. So you might want to look at the clauses. If they're truly cancelable. You can let them go. But otherwise, they should be treated as that. So now I have everything I need for Disney to compute a cost of capital. Cost of equity, risk-free rate, 2.75%. Why? Because I chose to compute the cost of capital in US dollars, not because it's a US company. Beta 1.0013. If that looks even mildly familiar, that's the bottom-up beta that we got for Disney based on the operating businesses they were in. 5.76% equity risk premium based on the countries or the, the geographies they operate in. Cost of equity of 8.52%. Cost of debt, risk-free rate, same risk-free rate. Always check that. The, the starting point should be the same for cost of equity and cost of debt. Add a default spread based on the rating of 1% times 1 minus a marginal tax rate gives me an after-tax cost of debt of 2.4%. Let me pause right there. What does equity cost Disney? 8.5%. What does debt cost them? 2.4%. Don't go where I think you want to go next because you're saying debt is so much cheaper than equity. So increasing debt will lower my... Don't do that yet. It's one of the biggest mistakes people make. And I saw Carl Icahn make this mistake when he targeted Apple. He said, well, if they borrowed 300 billion, the cost of capital definitely has to go down. How do you know? Because the debt is cheaper than equity. One part of that statement is true. Debt is always cheaper than equity. The other part is not. That's going to be the financing mix question we come back to. But at this point in time, they're about 88% equity based on the market value and based on the debt, which includes the leases, about 12% debt, giving me a cost of capital for Disney of 7.81%. If you remember for Disney, I did break them down into five businesses, right? So and I remember I computed the cost of equity. I completed the process. By doing what? By bringing in the debt ratios I estimated for each business and giving them all the same after-tax cost of debt. Why? Because they all borrowed through Disney, the corporate. When would I not do that? If you had a division that was a standalone division with its own rating, GE Capital used to have a different rating than GE and borrow on its own. Otherwise, just give it the company's cost of debt. I have a cost of capital for each business. At this stage, I have a luxury of riches, right? I have a cost of equity and a cost of capital for Disney, a cost of equity and a cost of capital for each of the five businesses. And I called, and the, remember, this was entirely the search for the hurdle rate. I've given you 12 different hurdle rates. You think, when do I decide to use which one? I'll get that process started, but let me complete the cost of capital for my other companies. For Baidu, I'm sorry, for Tata Motors, cost, I'm doing my cost of capital in rupee terms. The, basically, I computed the debt ratio. It's about 29% debt, 71% equity, weighted average. For Baidu, in Remimbi terms, again, 95% equity, 5% debt. The reason I did not mess too much with the rating is not a whole lot of debt. Cost of capital, 12.4%. For Bookscape, I computed two costs of capital. One based on the fact that the owner is not diversified, which gives them a total bait and a higher cost of equity. And the other based on what would happen if Bookscape were treated like a public company. Partly to see the penalty I face as a privately owned business. Cost of capital of 10.3% versus 6.57%. I'm going to use the 10.3% because the owner is not diversified. So I know that you have lots of things on your plate, but if you can get this part done for your company, because you have all the ingredients, get a cost of equity based on a bottom-up beta, risk-free rate, an equity risk premium, a cost of debt based on an actual rating or a synthetic rating, and come up with a cost of capital based on weights. 
And just for your own sake, compute market value weights, book value weights, because if you don't believe me about one being more conservative than the other, the only way to see that is to see what happens in your company. And you're going to get a cost of equity and a cost of capital of the company. So let me at least address when do you use which one? Because it looks like if I'm given a choice between 8.5%, which is my cost of equity, and 7.81% of the cost of capital, I'm going to pick the lower hurdle rate, right? That makes, you, know, you don't get to pick. Which one you use will depend on how you compute your cash flows and your returns. Let me at least start thinking about this process. When you look at a project, you can think like an equity investor. You can look at your return and equity, cash flows to equity. If that's what you're doing, the appropriate comparison is to the cost of equity. You can look at the overall project, what you make collectively as equity investors and lenders. Computer return and capital, we'll talk about the specific. The appropriate comparison there then is to the cost of capital. You don't get to pick and choose what you like to use once you've told me how you compute returns and cash flows. So when we get to the project section, that is one of the things we're going to talk about is how do you do returns and equity? How do you do returns on capital? Cash flows to equity, cash flows of firm. It might seem like I'm kind of, you know, looking at fine details, but it makes a big difference because you use very different discount rates on that. So that took us a long time third of the class to get the hurdle rate. But now when I read that statement, hopefully it has more edge to it. You can see the hurdle rate should be based on the riskiness of the investment you take. And we measure risk as the risk you cannot diversify away with equity and default risk with debt and should reflect the mix of debt and equity you have as a business. That comes in the weights in your cost of capital. So I'm at least going to get started on the next section because this is going to be where the other half of the financing principle comes in. I'm going to give you the theme that's going to underlie how we think about returns in finance. And it comes from one of my favorite movies, Jerry Maguire. Have you seen the movie? Okay. Cuba Gooding Jr. is the athlete. Tom Cruise is his agent. And somewhere along the course of the movie, you hear these words that, that go into history as one of the more famous words in a movie. Show me the money. Notice what he did not say. He didn't say, show me the accounting earnings. He didn't say, show me the operating income. Or the... He said, show me the money. In finance, it's all about cash flows. Cash in, cash out. So we're going to talk about returns reflecting how much you get as cash flows, reflecting when you get those cash flows. We just talked about show you a tiny how... 690 million 10 years from now is very different than 100 million or 70 million every year for the next 10 years. And we're going to bring in all those side things you want to talk about. How about this? How about that? How about synergy? It's going to be in the cash flows. So I'm going to start at least by talking about why earnings and cash flows can be different. I'm not an accountant. And I've kind of made it clear. But when I look at accounting from the outside, there are two principles in accounting that seem to govern how they measure numbers. The first is the notion of accrual accounting. What is accrual accounting required to do? Record transactions as they happen, right? So if you sell something on December 30th of a year, you have to show it as revenues this year, even though you haven't been paid for it. And if you pay, for, if you use things that you haven't paid for, so basically you record transactions that happen, revenues and expenses. As opposed to what? Cash accounting. Cash accounting, you look at cash revenues. As, as a company, you, you have to use accrual accounting. So it's not even a choice. But as a small private business, maybe you can do cash accounting. The second is accountants are kind of fixated on classifying expenses. I used to think they were consistent, but I no longer do. If you have expenses that create benefits only in the current year, it's operating expenses. Expenses that create benefits over many years are capital expenses and expenses associated with the use of debt are financial expenses. And each has its place, right? Operating expenses go in your income statement, reduce your revenues to get to operating income. Financial expenses get netted out of operating income to get to you know, taxable income and taxes. And capital expenses get depreciated or amortized over time. Very neat. Looks like it all fits. But those principles are the heart of why earnings and cash flows are going to be different. This is true across the board. Whether you're doing valuation, capital budgeting, to get from earnings to cash flows, there are only three adjustments you have to make. 
And you can make this as elaborate as you want. Here are the three adjustments. First, you're going to add back depreciation and amortization. So you start with the earnings. You add. Why, would, why do we do that? Why do we add back? Because I subtracted it out to get to income, but I've not spent the money, right? Nobody writes a check out to depreciation and amortization. So we add it back. Second stop, we subtract out capital expenditures. Why? Imagine buying land or a building from somebody and say, look, this is a capital expense. I don't usually pay for it right away because my accountant says it's a capital. No, you still pay for it, right? The fact that you might borrow money and, and pay for it doesn't. So it's a cash outflow, even though accountants don't treat it as, so we subtract out capital expenses. That includes everything from acquisitions to small projects, big projects. And third, we subtract our change in working capital. It's amazing. I know I see people doing this all the time in valuation. They've done valuation for their entire lifetimes. And they say, why do you do that? They just don't know. So you, you can probably fill in why, why, what is subtracting the change in working capital do that allows me to get to cash flows? What is accrual accounting required to do? Record transactions as they happen. So when you sold something on December 30th, I made you show it as revenues this year, but what else do you have to show on your balance sheet to reflect the fact that you haven't been paid? Receivables. If you use items that you haven't paid for, I ask you to show payables. Working capital is the residue of accrual accounting. When we do the change in working capital, we're effectively converting accrual income to cash income. Earnings and cash flows. Can the two be different? Yeah, because of the three reasons, right? And next class when we start, we're going to talk about why when they're, when they're different. You always go with the cash flows. Right? It's kind of an abandonment of that entire accounting class you spent. But accounting has its place. You need the accountants. But in this class, where, where is, what's a cash in? What's a cash out? It's going to be cash flow. So we'll start the next class with that with that question. So please do read the case when you get a chance because I, I think you can at least get that. Why for Valley on the slide, uh, you use the inflation differential and not the risk free rate in the tax. Uh, oh, okay, perfect. That's about either it. way. You know, because I for this project I, I really wanted to be a Brazilian company, but it was money losing until twenty two, but it just posted a great results for twenty three, so I might change the company. Yeah. 